The eLife Podcast from eLife, the open access journal for outstanding research in the life and biomedical sciences. Online at elifesciences.org. Hello, welcome to episode 61 of the eLife Podcast. I'm Chris Smith from The Naked Scientist. This month we hear how many new DNA mutations parents hand on to their children. Do good or bad learners really exist? And a genetic mystery 100 years in the making gets solved with a video camera. But to kick off this month, it does sound counterintuitive, but an extra hour or two in bed can help to reduce the risk of becoming obese. Less sleep, on the other hand, seems to be a potent stimulus to overeat, and especially to binge on high-calorie, fatty and sugary treats. But why is this? A new study by Serbi Batani from San Diego State University suggests that sleep deprivation leads to a surge in the body's own cannabis-like chemicals. These, she's found, cause a region of the brain called the insula to slacken its inhibitory grip on the brain's olfactory areas, making delicious treats smell just too tempting to resist. There is a huge body of research that suggests that chronic lack of sleep is associated with overall poor health. And there is a bunch of data showing that when you do not get enough sleep, you increase your food intake and people become more reactive to unhealthy foods and foods in particular, that are high in sugar and fat that we call junk food. What we really wanted to understand was why people crave these high-fat foods after a sleepless night. Back in the past, when people Mm -hmm. first began to flush out this association between not getting enough sleep and then rebound overeating, one one Mm -hmm. speculation was that the hunger hormone ghrelin which is produced by the stomach and is suppressed by sleep, that goes up. So there's just a rebound overeating to compensate. So is it as simple as that? It's more complicated than just like hunger hormones increasing because there are a lot of studies showing that people may not really physically feel hungry, but they still go for all those foods that are high in calories. So there has to be a different mechanism where basically it connects your sleep loss with consumption of very high calorie foods. So your brain or your body saying that I really want a donut or I really want potato chips. So you're saying that there's a switch in terms of food choices, but it's not necessarily just driven by overall increase in hunger. Exactly. And what do you think underpins that then? We definitely think that there are some brain signals that may be playing a role in overeating of not so healthy foods. And past research primarily has shown that sleep deprivation increases certain endocannabinoids. So these endocannabinoids are basically these naturally produced neurotransmitters that bind to some of the receptors in the brain and affect feeding behavior. So they're very similar to cannabis-like compounds that can cause cannabis-related munchies. On the other hand, we also kind of know that sense of smell is also really tightly related to how we choose food items. And in particular, animal studies have shown that these endocannabinoids enhance food intake by increasing the activity of brain areas that process odors. So what we thought was that maybe we can put all of this together and ask if what people choose to eat when they are sleep deprived is related to how the brain responds to food smells. Where in the pathway would you see this effect manifest then? Would it be at the receptor level, how sensitive the receptors are to the molecules that make food smell and taste the way it does? Would it be in the olfactory bulb where the first processing occurs? Or would it be at cortical level where the olfactory tracks go into the brain and start depositing signals relative to what they think they're smelling? That's a very interesting question because it's very difficult to tell exactly where the processes are happening. So you mentioned olfactory bulb. You really can't image olfactory bulb in humans. But what we found in our study was that when people were sleep deprived, so they only slept for four hours, the following day when we scanned their brains inside an MRI scanner and made them smell these delicious food odors and also some of the non-food odors, the piriform cortex, the region of the brain where smells are processed, 
in that particular region, the patterns of food versus non-food odors were significantly different in sleep-deprived state. So what this means in simple terms is the smell processing region, the brain goes into this hyperdrive, it sharpens the food odors for the brain so it can better differentiate between food and non-food odors. And how do you tie that to changes in the endocannabinoid system, these, these natural brain chemicals that mimic cannabis? The piriform cortex also sends signal or information out to other brain regions, in particular insula cortex. So insula receives signals that are important for food intake. And when a person is sleep deprived, signaling between the piriform cortex, the smell processing region, and the insula, that connection was not as strong. So the signaling actually reduced. And we also found that because of this reduction in communication, people ended up eating more energy-dense foods. Now, how is it connected to the endocannabinoids or the neurotransmitters? When we did the blood analysis, we saw that people had certain components of this endocannabinoid system very high in the blood. And those people also consumed very high energy-density food. So putting all this together, our results suggest that the sleep deprivation really influences this endocannabinoid system, which in turn alters this connection between piriform cortex and insular cortex, and ultimately leads to a shift towards foods which are high in calories. What would happen if you did this experiment then in an anosmic individual? Are people with, say, Kalman syndrome who can't smell things or people who've had hand injuries and their nose doesn't work properly, are they immune to the appetite-boosting effects of sleep deprivation? That is a very interesting question. So um, interestingly, there aren't really any studies done in this area with anosmic individuals. So uh, there is no research out there showing that sleep deprivation can really affect those people who can't really smell. So it'll be interesting to do those kinds of uh, research in future and kind of see whether they are more protected towards these effects of overeating or sleep-related overeating or not. It will indeed. Serbi Batani there. Every one of us got half of our genetic information from each of our parents. But how many new mutations did mum or dad hand on to us? And if mum and dad had waited a few more years before they'd had us, how much of a difference would that have made? Now, thanks to a remarkable study looking at whole families conceived over significant periods of time, we know Thomas Sassani is at the University of Utah. Every generation, we receive half of our DNA from each of our parents. But what we were really interested in figuring out is how many sort of new mutations are present in the DNA that we inherit? Essentially, how many spelling errors are there in the genetic code that we receive from our parents? Did we not know that already? So the actual estimated number, this sort of number of spelling errors, was actually pretty well appreciated, and and it's been estimated a, a number of times before. But what's less well appreciated is how all sorts of different other factors, like the age of your parents when you're born, actually affects that number. Because we often say, have your children when you're young, because A, you're more fertile, but B, the risk of having things like chromosomal abnormalities increases with parental age. So is that true then? Yeah, so that's absolutely true. Um, In this study, actually, we were a little bit less interested in sort of the large chromosomal changes, things like the aneuploidy that you mentioned, and more interested in sort of individual spelling errors, so single letter changes in the DNA that you inherit from your parents, a T instead of a C. Did you have to therefore go and laboriously read the genetic code of loads and loads of individuals to work out how different they are from each parent? Essentially, yeah, that's exactly what we did. In practice, what this amounts to is you sequence the entire genome of both parents and you sequence the genomes of all of their children. And then you sort of go child by child and compare their genome sequence to the sequence of both of their parents. And you just look for the places in the genome where they're different, where even though you would expect that child to share half of their DNA with each parent, at a small number of sites, they'll actually have unique mutations that neither of their parents had. And have you done the experiment where you could, for instance, take a family and the the, the parents are obviously correspondingly younger when they have one child and older when they have subsequent children, and then you could compare how many changes there are in each of the subsequent children, therefore relate that to parental age? 
Yes, so that's exactly right. Um, and really one of the, the fantastic things about the data set that we were working with, normally when studies like this are done, you use two parents and maybe one or two children. But in this study, we had some families that had up to 16 children. And so those children represent, as you were saying, parents when they were, say, 20 years old, all the way up to when they were maybe 40 years old. And so we were able to compare the number of new mutations we see in children born to young parents and children born to that same set of parents, but when they were much older. And what trends emerged? So overall, on average, the number of these new mutations that you see in kids definitely increases as parents get older. So it amounts to about one and a half new mutations every year dads get older and about 0.5 additional mutations every year mom gets older. That's quite a lot, isn't it? And and, and interesting that there's that disparity between the sexes. Does that reflect the fact that sperm are made as a continuous process from ongoing divisions in stem cells, whereas eggs get made when actually the individual is themselves developing from an egg and therefore the chances of the DNA in the egg becoming mutated is lower? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think for a long time that's really been the sense in the field is that every year after puberty sperm cells or the the stem cells that will eventually develop into sperm cells, they're constantly dividing. And the idea is that every time you have to copy your genome, there's a chance for an error to occur. Now, it turns out that there's a hypothesis that the constant sperm cell divisions are not the only reason that there's this kind of bias of de novo mutations in fathers, and that there may be things like accumulating DNA damage and other sources But certainly the increased number of divisions in the sperm cells are probably contributing a little bit to that bias that we see in dads. When you say a little bit, do you have a feeling for when most of these mutations are acquired? Because one other possibility, surely, is that not just the sperm and the eggs contribute, but if the embryo itself is not faithfully copying DNA, maybe quite a big amount of that mutation burden could occur after fertilisation has occurred. Yeah, that's a great point. We actually were able to get a sense of this in our paper, largely owing to the fact that we had a lot of these large and three-generation families. So we were able to apply a strategy whereby we were able to figure out, essentially, if these new mutations had occurred after the sperm and the egg came together to, to produce an embryo, or if they happened before. And we actually found that about 10% of all of these new mutations that we saw were likely occurring in that embryo. And was that itself influenced by the age of the sperm and the egg? So were older parents more likely to have highly mutating embryos or was the mutation rate in the embryo at about 10% regardless of parental age? Yeah, so in the embryo at least, we didn't see that the number of new mutations was really affected by the age of the parents. However, overall, the the mothers and fathers in our study were generally under the age of 40 or 50, and it's possible that there may be an effective age in much, much older parents, but we really weren't able to detect that, at least in our data set. So although you can say that with increasing parental age, there does appear to be a higher mutation burden being handed on to kids, but presumably one constraint of this study is you can't say at the moment whether or not that's going to have a clinical impact. Yeah, that's right. So If you think about the number of mutations that we're seeing, 70 new mutations on average in a child, and the number of new mutations might increase by 1.5 or 0.5 per year, depending on the parent you're looking at. But again, this is out of 3 billion or, or 6 billion total letters in the human genome. And so in practice, not very many of these mutations are actually landing in genes, regions of the genome that actually make functional protein. And so at least at this point, it's, it's tough to say um, how frequently we'd expect these to be damaging or cause disease. But certainly there are a number of rare genetic diseases caused by these kinds of mutations. And so having a good handle on how frequently they occur is, I think, important in its own right. Thomas Sasani. You're listening to the eLife podcast from The Naked Scientist with me, Chris Smith. Still to come, the online rant that turned into a probing exploration of life as an early career research group leader and what makes someone a better learner. Before that, though, and still on the subject of genes, to a genetic mystery that's taken a 100 years to solve. Scientists have finally discovered why flies with the yellow gene aren't very lucky in love. And it's not, as the first geneticists thought, anything to do with behaviour. From Harvard, Jonathan Massey. In the early 20th century, in Thomas Hunt Morgan's fly lab, he was one of the first geneticists to ever work with fruit flies. He started collecting the first mutants in the lab 
And the reason why he was able to find them is because they had these pigmentation malformations in the body of the flies. So when he would dump his fruit flies out of his bottle into the microscope, he noticed about one in several thousand wouldn't have the right colored eyes or wouldn't have the right colored body. One of the first mutants was a yellow colored fly that he discovered. And so he took this yellow fly, bred them together with other yellow flies, and he found out they bred true, which just means that that yellow color was heritable. And so that became what is known as the yellow mutant fly. And did he work out roughly how many genes, it's a single gene, isn't it, that influences this, were involved because those breeding experiments mapped onto the numbers that Mendel had produced with his pea plants. So we know when you've got one single gene influencing a factor, you get a certain proportion of different characteristics in the the first generation, second generation, and so on. That's right. So that's a good question. His undergrad student at the time, Alfred Sturdivant, in 1915 or so, created the first genetic map ever. So Alfred Sturdivant, um, through genetic crosses, discovered that genes are inherited on chromosomes, and chromosomes are linear pieces of genetic material. And so through genetic crosses, just like Gregor Mendel did with his pea plants, they were able to discover not only that yellow was a single gene, but that yellow was a gene that was linked to the X chromosome, which is inherited from mothers, just like in humans and flies. Were they intrigued by the fact that these were pretty rare, these flies? So the fact that that this gene was mutated and these mutants were cropping up, but then they didn't get an increase in numbers of them, argued that there was something wrong with yellow flies. Were they intrigued by that? Yes. So Alfred Sturdivant had many broad interests. He wanted to understand the basics of genetics, how chromosomes work, how they're inherited, but he also was really interested in speciation and biodiversity He noticed it was difficult to maintain these flies, and he wanted to understand why. And so he did a very basic experiment. He took the yellow mutant males, and he put them in a chamber with normal female flies. And he noticed that while they courted the females, like normal flies do, they very rarely were ever to actually mate with them successfully. So he wrote a little paper in 1919 describing this result, and it wasn't until Uh, the 1950s, that it was picked up again. And what did people conclude when they revisited the work? What was their conclusion as to why these flies were not maintained in the population? Yeah, it's a fascinating history. Margaret Bastock, a behavioural biologist in Nico Tinbergen's lab in the 1950s, she concluded after Alfred Sturdivant's work that indeed the flies courted normally, but they didn't mate just like Sturdivant described. Her conclusion from a beautiful study using a a tape recorder to describe the behavior of the fly over time, was that although they courted like normal flies, they didn't do so in such an excited way. Did people think then that this gene was in some way affecting the, the nervous system of the animals? Because pigmentation is intrinsically tied up with other chemicals that are also employed as neurochemicals. I'm thinking of dopamine, for example, which is made from the same precursor, tyrosine, that you can turn into a range of different things. Did they think that the coloration was a side effect of different neurochemistry and that's why the behavior was wrong and that's why they weren't mating very much? So in the 1950s, uh, they didn't know what yellow did as a, a protein. And believe it or not, in 2019, we still don't know what the yellow protein does. But it wasn't until the 1980s and the 1990s that part of that biochemical work was uh, worked out. And as a consequence of that, like you suggest, For the most part, geneticists concluded that, well, the reason yellow mutant flies have abnormal behavior is because they have low or abnormal dopamine levels in their brain. And is that true? How have you gone about testing that? Because obviously you visited this and said, right, let's take a modern look at this quite old problem. Exactly. So in 2016, an undergraduate, Dion Chung, and I decided to team up to try to solve the problem. And I, like geneticists for the last 30 years, also believed the problem dealt with dopamine. And the way we went about asking the question is to selectively remove the yellow gene from the brain of the fly and ask what happens to their behavior. And what we found is the flies behaved completely normally. Not only did they court normally, but they mated normally. So they didn't behave like the yellow mutants do. From that study, we were able to conclude that really its function outside the nervous system is what's important for behavior. So what is it then? We know that yellow is required to make black pigments or black melanin in the fly. That's why 
when you remove the function of yellow, the fly turns yellow. What we discovered is that specifically yellow function in making black pigments in these structures on their legs that are called sex combs is required for flies' ability to mate. So when you remove yellow protein from these very tiny structures on the front legs of the males, the males lose the ability to grab the females, and that's what disrupts their ability to mount and to finish the mating sequence. How did the earlier workers miss that? It wasn't until about 15 years ago that geneticists developed tools in flies to be able to answer these targeted questions. They didn't have the ability to remove the function of the yellow gene in different tissues of the fly. The other thing that was critical for this project is we used a high-speed video camera that slowed down the mating sequence to 1,000 frames per second. And so you could see all of the really fascinating details of how the fly is moving. And it was at that point we decided, aha, this is likely what's wrong. We noticed that though they're recording fine, that last sequence in which they tried to grab the female seemed disrupted. And that's what pointed us towards uh, the sex comb hypothesis. Fascinating. Thank you very much to Jonathan Massey for a jolly good genetic yarn. Now, some people are better learners than others. That's a fact. Or is it? Because actually, it turns out that there might just be a disparity between the way that they learn best and the way that the information is being presented to them, as UCSF's David Metz has been finding with his songbirds. Some people learn better and others learn worse. And there's some evidence that some of that is genetically driven, but we know that some of it can be environmentally driven. And so one question is, can we provide a better environment for some genetic makeups to increase learning outcomes? In other words, if if I'm a genetic poor learner, can you nonetheless compensate by changing the environment to one to which I'm better adapted to learn in? That's right. And additionally, you might not be genetically a poor learner, you just prefer to learn with a specific type of presentation. And so you might seem poor because the stimulus isn't presented in a way that is tuned to your preferences. But if you tune it more accurately, you're actually quite a good learner. And how have you been looking at this? The system where we study this is in songbirds, and they learn their vocalizations in a process very similar to how humans learn speech. They listen to their dad early in life, and then they go on to practice, 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 and ultimately produce a very complex vocalization. Um, And this is a powerful system because we can vary the environmental parameters, and we also can vary the genetics. So we can get asked very specific questions about, is this the right environment for this individual based on their genetic makeup, uh, or is it the wrong environment? How did you actually do that then? How did you vary the genetics and vary the environmental parameters in order to test that and tease apart the two? So in this particular population of finches where we work, we know that some individuals are biased genetically to sing faster and some are biased to sing slower. We can go in and take individuals that we know to be genetically biased to sing faster and we can take some individuals and present them with a tutor song that is similarly fast or a tutor song that is at sort of an average rate or at a very slow rate. And then we can see how well they learn in those three different environments. And we can do that for fast learners, medium learners, and also slow learners. So this is a bit like I go to a lecturer at medical school and some lecturers teach with overheads, some teach with PowerPoint, and some are in the dark ages with talk and chalk. And it suits some of the class better than others. And so you're varying the different teaching styles. But how about the genetics? Because you mentioned you can also mix that up. Yeah. So in this case... We basically took a population that is a genetically heterogeneous population, so there's lots of different individuals have different genetic makeups, and we can measure how that genetic bias works. So basically, uh, we take individuals from all different genetic backgrounds, and we provide them with one tutor song, and we see what they end up being biased to sing. Basically, we have a fixed environment, and we see if they look, they behave as their father behaved. And so we can then estimate whether that bird is biased to sing fast or slow based on the genetics. And then the obvious question you're going to be asking is, right, OK, a bird that doesn't learn well in one setting, if we vary the conditions, it might be a slow learner in one setting, but then we switch modality and it learns much better. Yes, that's right. 
One possibility is that you see better and worse learning, and the best stimulus will be the average song. So we provide everybody with an average song, and some individuals appear to be poor learners, some individuals appear to be good learners. The birds who in that context appear to be poor learners, we take those guys and we say, oh, well, what's their genetic bias? Oh, these guys were all genetically biased to sing slowly. And so we'll provide them with a slow stimulus, and we'll see what happens. And for all of the birds, for slow birds, medium birds, and fast birds, providing a stimulus matched to their genetics increased their learning. And in many cases, it increased it to the point of being essentially equivalent across the different genetic backgrounds. So it really is horses for courses when it comes to learning, isn't it? Why do you think this relationship exists? I think that this relationship exists mostly because there is genetic diversity. Individuals are different, and their brains are built in different ways, and they're more adept at thinking about things in this dimension or that dimension. To some degree, that's determined genetically. But the mind has such capacity for adaptation and plasticity and taking in information that really these genetic influences are tamped by that ability, but tuning it a little bit to be slightly more appropriate uh, results in better learning. And, and so I think it really is just a, a product of having, you know, organisms that are to some degree influenced by their genetic structure and, and then also uh, an incredibly adaptive neural system that, that, that helps them learn. The parallels with humans, now you talk about it and as I come to think about it, are really potentially very striking, aren't they? When you think, how does advertising work? What's the best way to teach children in a classroom? Are influencers on YouTube influential because of whom they're talking to and the way they're doing it? Yes, it's an excellent question. We focus in the paper on the case of trying to adapt learning stimuli to individuals to increase outcomes. And we have been actually quite slow at doing at applying that kind of idea in, uh, in educational settings. But Google and YouTube and Facebook and so on are extremely good at figuring out your individual proclivities and providing you with an ad that matches you perfectly, matches your biases, um, and shifts you even further in, in a specific direction. So Facebook, Google and all those influencers on YouTube probably know you a lot better than you even know yourself. And that's a sobering thought, isn't it? David Metz there from UCSF. Now, in the words of co-author Sophie Acton, who took me through what happened, it began as an online whinge on Twitter. But as responses poured in, it rapidly transformed into a valuable publishable data set that's now a paper in eLife. And it documents the, quite frankly, mixed experiences of early career lab group leaders. Well, in the end, it was more than we expected. It was about 385 people responded, primarily people who work in the life sciences. We have all started independent research labs at various universities in the last five years. And we collected this data mostly through advertising via Twitter. We're all, our generation of researchers, very active in social media. We're trying to get our voices and our research heard. And the word just spread. It just took off. So everybody responded to a survey that we'd put together and added their comments. When we saw the data, like we really should publish this. And what was it you were seeking to probe, mostly? I think just a fairness, that these are a bunch of really bright people. They've been very successful in their training to that point. They have great ideas. They've been given grant funding. And we just want everybody to have equal opportunity to make the most of that. And some people were reporting that they were really being stuck. They were having trouble with getting lab space. They were having trouble recruiting people. They were being swamped with teaching load all these various issues and, and other people were swimming through and having a great time but we are we were all starting at the same level and we wanted everybody to have that opportunity to show what they could do. And when you began to unpick and decode the data you had collected what messages emerged? I mean what did you find from this? The one very surprising issue that we found was a gender disparity that I genuinely did not expect and that came through in starting salaries. It came through in the research group size, so people recruiting. It came through in teaching load. It came through in administration of working in committees. And they're very small differences. But I can imagine that these may compound over the years. And if you're starting off unequal, that's something we should really take notice of and fix. 
It does seem rather strange, doesn't it? Because, you know, when we hire people, for instance, in the medical job I do, I was doing some interviews this week, it's not the individual that attracts a salary, it is the role that they're going to do. And you hire a person and they earn whatever that role is specified to earn. And I thought that academic salaries were the same. I thought so too. And certainly the way I was recruited, it wasn't really given as an option. There was no negotiation of salary. I was told that if you join this department in this role, you bring that funding, this is your starting salary. But I pre- presume there must be a little bit of wiggle room in certain situations where people are asking for just a couple more increment points on a scale here and there that's being awarded and that those little negotiations tend to be done by the male applicants. I'll read you one of the quotes that you put from one of your respondents in the survey because it really... It made me laugh, but also (laughs) for the right reason, but made me think. And this person says, I feel like I'm trying to do three separate jobs, research, management, admin, teaching. There's a slash between management and admin, which is why she says three, as well as be a mother. To be my own postdoc, because I can't afford one. To be a lab technician, because I can't afford one. To be the lab manager, because I can't afford one. To be a good mentor for my PhD students, etc. The the point that's been made here is that this is a very stressful position because all the time prior to this in a scientific career a person is largely having their life sorted out for them aren't they at university we get spoon fed as a phd student we're often handed a project and guided through it as a postdoc we're part of a moving train and suddenly you have to stand on your own two feet and and it sounds to me from this that that um you know many of your respondents are feeling that they could be better directed or better supported in the in the early ramp up to get their career airborne absolutely the The people who responded who were happy in their positions, stressful as it may be, were the ones that had mentorship, that had supportive heads of department, who were eased into these various roles gradually when they have no experience of management, teaching, um, all of those things. They can come gradually with the right preparation. All people have been on training courses and leadership courses, but there are others in that cohort who were just thrown into all of these things at once. So get grant money, hire students, set up your lab, be on these committees, teach this many hours a week. And that's so different from the training that they'd received to that point. We all had. We focus on one research project as a postdoc. We focus purely on the science and getting out something new. And then as soon as you're managing a group, even if it's a group of two or three people, there's all these other roles that we're just not adequately trained for. So we could really use a bit of input on that front, could we? I think we? there's some really simple interventions that would just level the playing field for everybody. It looks like also from your survey that the universities across the country, and these are Russell Group universities heavily represented in your data, so these are some of the foremost institutions in the world, let alone in the UK. They're, they're trying to have their cake and eat it here, aren't they? Because some of the people who've responded to your survey are really high flyers. They've brought in enormous amounts of grant money, but they're being given a soft contract and they're being handed, in some cases, enormous teaching burdens, more than people who are full-time teachers at universities. I know. I don't know how that can be possible, but it is happening. We do have individuals in our cohort that report that they've got a full teaching load and they may have brought in multi-million pound research grants and they just feel like their hands are tied and they cannot do it all. And people going to these very prestigious institutions should be treated like they are those high flyers and, and mentored into being the next generation of amazing scientists, not burdened with everything um, in, and, and set up for failure. Hopefully, at the end of your paper, you've got this survival guide, what, <laughs> what amounts to a survival guide for PIs. This is advice that's culled from you collectively as a group who've made it, but also from the survey data, isn't it? What would be your top few tips for people who may be listening to this and they're about to start a group or they're about to embark on this particular career track? Yes, and they have been our main audience, I have to say. The number of people who've said this transparency has been amazing The most important points I think that we raise here are to have as much transparency as you can when you're negotiating. There may not be very much to negotiate, but get in writing the things that you need. Get your head of department to really adhere to those things in writing before you start. You may also take from the data sets what the starting salary should or 
or the average starting salaries are. So if you feel that you're on the lower levels of those, you can now take this data set, show them it, it's published, and say, why are you suggesting that I'm on this grade when actually I know a lot of people and the same funding that I'm bringing in are recruited as a senior lecturer level and, and vice versa. So you can have those conversations when you're applying a little bit more, uh, with a bit more backing, I suppose. So play a little bit harder to get from the get-go would appear to be the moral of that story. Sophie Acton there, she is an immunologist at UCL. That's it for this month. You've been listening to the eLife podcast that's produced by The Naked Scientists. Previous editions, references and the full text transcripts for these programmes, as well as details on how you can subscribe to this podcast, are at nakedscientist.com slash eLife. And incidentally, if science news is your thing, The Naked Scientists also publish a weekly science programme which covers the latest leading science stories. You just look up Naked Scientists podcast via your favourite podcasting app, or you can get it from our website, nakedscientists.com. I'll be back with the next episode of the eLife podcast in December, but until then, from me, Chris Smith, thanks for listening and goodbye. The eLife podcast from eLife. The open access journal for outstanding research in the life and biomedical sciences. Online at elifesciences.org.